tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Many, including myself, believe that audio horror is the horror of the future. Hearing is one of the most advanced senses, coming after sight and smell by a decent chunk of evolutionary generations. Now, horrifying smells have had their day, and, as of this writing, are now enjoyed by only the most flatulent of enthusiasts. Visual horror still carries a certain mystique, though, and, if you have a taste for antiquated and primitive forms of entertainment, our friends at Shudder may have exactly what you're looking for, or listening for, for those a few more rungs up the evolutionary chain. With Shudder, you can stream supernatural, thriller, and horror movies, as well as some curious short-form conveyance of episodic storytelling called shows. I know, I know. You're asking yourself, what exactly is this troglodyte trying to sell me on? Even the lesser invertebrates have eyes. Let them pay only $5.99 a month to stream Shudder's ever-expanding library of ad-free entertainment. I've got podcasts. And, you know, only a week ago, I would have thought the same. However, the folks at Shudder, well, they might just be onto something. Try it out for yourself. You can even stream your first 30 days free. It does have a certain edgy retro charm. Just be sure to start slow. Maybe with the sound off and the subtitles on. Our higher brain functions can be prone to sensory overload. And you'll want to ease in gently. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 16. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and tonight I'm proud to bring you Part 2 and the thrilling conclusion to On These Blackened Shores of Time by Brian Hodge. That's it. I feel like you got enough intro for three episodes last time, so we're just going to go right into it. Shall we? Of course, I do recommend you become a patron. No ads, lots more episodes going back to 2012. Really supports us. I get the impression some listeners think that we make like movie star salaries here on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill. Well, let me tell you, we don't. So the more patrons we get, the less time I have to spend at my day job and the more time I can spend getting more content to you. That's all there is to it. 
and almost as helpful, just tell people about the show. Please post about it in your Facebook feed, on Instagram, wherever. You guys get the word out enough, I'll be able to quit my day job, double the length of these episodes, and put in a lot of nice special effects and better production values. Because if things keep going the way they have been for the last year, I just don't know how much longer I can do this. All right, that's the end of my depressing NPR-style begathon. So let's finish this story. And now, without further ado, from author Brian Hodge, I give you part two and the conclusion to On These Blackened Shores of Time. It seemed unwise to leave a car untended for hours in a place we didn't belong. We covered the distance on foot, the summer heat building in that first quiet hour of daylight as we skirted the backsides of homes and neighborhoods that petered out against the hills. The Barnsley land was six acres of nothing much. Enough traces of outbuildings and fences remained to show that, decades ago, it might have passed as a small farm. Now, it was a run-down pocket of decay, a pustule of times past clinging to the land. The house, two stories and shabby, was in need of paint and new shingles, and matched the unsavory impression I'd gotten from Otto Barnsley's candid snapshot. And Ginny had come here alone. It bugged me that McNabb might not have been giving Alvin Barnsley as much credit as he should have, she told me along the way. His intention all along was getting back into the mine. That much seems obvious. I started wondering if he didn't know something more than he should have. He either knew of another way in already, or thought he could find it. The notion had crossed my mind even before Drew's car had been recovered. Another way in. It's the kind of thing you pray for, and the answer is always no. I had still asked, and DeSalvo had double-checked her department's archives. When she said there was no such route, I believed her, because the alternative, that a back way existed but no one knew where to find it anymore, was too terrible to live with. Maybe it had taken someone like Jenny to disregard the experts. Sometimes mines link up with cave systems or older mines, or something happens to connect one thing with another, she said. Do you remember hearing about the Knox mine disaster growing up? The name was familiar but had no details attached. It happened around here too. 1959. The Susquehanna broke through into one mine gallery and flooded God knows how many others between Port Griffith and Exeter. They were digging where they shouldn't have, so... Yeah, things link up, even when they're not supposed to. To our left, from where we stood on this derelict homestead, paid for with blood and starvation, the hills rose and rolled away. Green, thick with trees, festooned with the last tatters of morning mist. The water that washed out that shaft underneath our street had to come from somewhere. It didn't come from our storm drains. Whatever's upstream of there, it has to extend a long way. Jenny pointed into the hazy hills. It may not start here, but it runs through here. She said this like there was no question about it. She just knew. Maybe not yesterday, but today, after whatever she'd done in this house last night, she knew. I've seen the map. You didn't think about going through official channels on this? She looked at me as if, for the moment, she was forced to suffer a fool. Every husband knows that look. Channels are what got the sinkhole filled in inside of a week. Channels are what left those miners down there to die. Channels would be less concerned with what I found and more with how I found it. So, fuck Channels. Because I'm here for Drew and Katie. 
I followed her across the sagging boards of a creaking porch inside. The house put me in mind of Wesley McNabb's office, but that was one room. Here, it consumed everything, and must have taken lifetimes. A single obsession passed down to generations. The walls were hung with maps. One appeared so archaic a museum might have valued it at a small fortune, but it detailed no geography I could recognize. Its text and no alphabet I knew. The newest, global, bristled with pushpins. One at our location, and three dozen more across every continent from west to east, from Antarctica to Siberia. Others showed Earth's land masses in different stages of continental drift. Pangaea, then Gondwana land in Laurasia, and onward, the later ones appended with a vast island in the South Pacific that had no existing coralin. Rulie, some ornate hand had labeled it. Photos? Those too, spanning decades of excavations and expeditions in deserts and jungles, forests and mountains. A man with slicked back hair and a machete stood over a litter of ferns beside an idol that might have been worshipped by maritime pagans. A sepia-toned team stood atop a jumble of stone blocks, utterly dwarfed by them, in the cleft of a remote alpine valley. Books? God, yes. Innumerable volumes on archaeology, geology, anthropology, astronomy, biology, metallurgy, advanced geometry, and mathematics. An entire shelf was devoted to human anatomy, including textbooks on autopsies. Another was themed around ritual magic, supplemented by notebooks and legal pads beyond counting. I could think of bureau profilers who would have loved to spend a month combing through everything. And all this was just along the path to where Ginny had secured Otto Barnsley hours earlier. His right wrist lashed to his left ankle with a zip-tie cuff. Another secured his right ankle to the iron leg of a wood stove. She used these plastic cuffs in her classes teaching women how to fight with their hands bound, or to break the cuffs if they were strong enough. Never before had she used them with bad intentions. And just like that, it occurred to me, we are on the wrong side of the law here, and I don't care about that, because I don't know what he's on the wrong side of. Oh my... Barnsley said when he saw me in feigned alarm. He is a big one. I came here hoping I could appeal to his sense of decency, Jenny told me. He doesn't have one. Otto Barnsley peered up at us as if studying curiosities. Although the hours may have left him uncomfortable, he was not afraid. He was a soft-looking man, something larval about him, wholly unwholesome, the kind of person whose handshake would send you looking for the nearest faucet. I have other virtuous attributes. He glanced at Ginny, then down at his predicament. Some evidently need a little more work. The side of his face was bruised. I had never known Ginny to go on the offensive, but she was an easy one to underestimate at first glance, with no second chances. What did he do? I said. What did he try? I handled it. She laid a steadying grip on my arm. Keep your set point. What we're here for. We locked eyes and she didn't let go until I calmed my breathing again. She was right. I wasn't ready to know what this man had thought he could get away with. Not yet. Details gave you reasons to snap. Instead, I focused on this. Otto Barnsley didn't seem the type who ventured out to gawk at tragedies. He had to have been engrossed in the sinkhole itself, enough to show up every day with a vested interest in what the crews might discover. I suspected... 
He'd gone home relieved. The map's over here, Jenny said, and retreated to the nearest dingy corner. She'd removed it from its frame and spread it across a tabletop, yellowed paper the size of a poster, lined with a faint grid, and filled in with what looked like ink over initial tracings of pencil. It was creased with enough folds to reduce to pocket size, but felt as if it had been a long time since it had been anything other than flat under glass. It showed an entrance in a meandering channel that periodically branched off to other passages or ballooned into chambers. Near the south, it dog-legged down into a link-up with Tecumseh number 24, overlaid shadings depicting the various galleries of the mine's third and fourth levels. This point of connection between the mine and the rest was the real anomaly. There weren't many straight lines on the map, but here, where the passages linked to the mine, was a square. I wasn't sure what the map scale was or if it was even accurate, but in context this feature appeared to have the foundational dimensions of a house. They'd hit a wall, Nick Nab had told me. Nothing natural, but constructed. I tapped the map. What is this square? Barnsley grinned, mocking. What indeed? Jenny touched my arm. If he decides to tell you anything more than he told me, fill me in. I need to round up some things for us on the back porch. She folded the map and took it with her. Barnsley watched it go as if this was the first thing to cause him distress. I caught it in that split second he tensed and squinched his eyes, a form of what's called eye-blocking. My grandfather thought his fortune was going to come from artifacts, Barnsley said. In time, he realized it was in knowledge instead. Knowledge being the true pearl of great price. But that structure down there was one thing he never understood. My father fared no better in his short life. It was a discovery ahead of its time. But you understand. I believe I do. Not without help. I'm just its humble custodian. There are people and organizations who've been studying the ecliptid mystery since long before Alvin Barnsley came north to steal a man's job and found a new path in life. What is it then? Otto plainly loved to hear himself talk, but now he dodged. Were you a godly man, Mr. Whitesides? Not especially. Oh, what a pity. It's always delicious when someone's celestial illusions are shattered. Now Barnsley was the one reading me, that I had ceased to follow him. Sometimes you brutish types who go into career fields where you get to legally hurt people have a crusader mentality. You have the kind of devoutness that leads you to conclude your god made you big for a reason. You break all the harder for it. He sighed with disappointment. Hmm. I would have enjoyed seeing that. Not a godly man yourself, I take it? To the contrary, I have many gods. The kind that are worthy of the title because they have no use for it. Or for me. It's a big universe out there. What kind of worthy god would stoop so low as to concern itself with the jabbering apes like you and me? Worthy gods only care about worlds, not their inhabitants. Worthy believers don't care about worship, only transfiguration. It was a relief to hear Jenny calling up the hallway from the back of the house. Barnsley... I had decided, was the type who liked to appear cooperative, but only to steer a conversation where he wanted it to go. All I needed to know was this. If that structure in the mine was artificial, then Barnsley and his fathers had taken what was potentially the greatest archaeological find in history 
and kept it to themselves. Or, going by the evidence of the walls, between themselves and a clandestine network whose beliefs were beyond easy understanding, these were grotesquely selfish people. If you've got something to add, now's the time, I said. It's getting late. Before you go, would you do me the kindness of cutting these oversized bread ties she's trussed me up with? He looked at the clock. You've reached the point of inhumane already, and there's a possibility you won't be coming back. Not anytime soon, anyway. So there's no reason to compound the inhumanity by leaving me like this to perish. We wouldn't want that on your conscience. Would we? Or are you as deficient of conscience as I am of decency? When I hesitated, he knew what that meant. Oh, you think I want to stop you from this mission? Hmm. Not at all. You'll be the first newcomers in years who wanted to go in there willingly. I'm as curious as you are to see what happens next. I'm happy to share. I'd heard enough. I followed Ginny to the back of the house and found her in a storeroom off the porch, furiously scouring the inside of a pair of face masks with alcohol swabs. There was more safety gear stowed here than one man alone would ever need. Barnsley, had called himself the mine's custodian, had alluded to groups coming to study it as far back as his grandfather's day, and this much I could believe. This house was a way station for strange people with stranger agendas. We've got a decision to make, I said. Do you have the cutter for his cuffs? Jenny didn't want to release him, but neither did she want to be the kind of monster who left him this way indefinitely. It wasn't a proud moment for either of us. I cut him loose. You were somebody's son once, and I just want to get mine back if he's there to be found, whatever condition he's in, even if it's just bones. You get that, don't you? Barnsley stretched and massaged the ligature creases in his plump skin. What's not to get? Have you seen him? I leaned close enough for Barnsley to smell murder on my breath. When's the last time you were down there? I tried once after the flood, still too mucky for my tastes, and now... He shrugged. Hmm, my ankles swell. As hikes go, it's not what my British friends call a doodle. I drew back again. What is that structure down there? Is it a room? A vault? He looked at me with bloodshot eyes, watery and puffy, but dreamer's eyes nonetheless. I'd seen these eyes on killers with trails of graves behind them, driven by a calm conviction that they were so far ahead of the rest of humanity. They might as well have been recognized as a more advanced offshoot of the species. I've come to regard it as a machine, he said. The oldest machine in the solar system. One of the engines of creation. And, if I wasn't sure what to make of that, I did believe one thing he'd said. He was happy to share. But, whether he thought he was sharing it with us, or us with it, I could not tell. Earlier, we were discussing certain lesser evolved forms of sensory stimulation. And, I gotta say, this shutter service, it's decent. Decent as all get out for entertainment primarily consumed through the primitive visual cortex. Don't get me wrong, I'm an ear man through and through. Always have been. I had a few friends in college who were exclusive eye guys always going on about the size of their rods and cones, judging others on trochlear tightness, where if their occipital lobe stays perky, even when not wearing a skull. 
rather than on the content of their character. I always just assumed they were uncultured brutes. Now, I'm starting to get the appeal. I mean, you just gotta see this library for yourself. From new original movies like VHS 94 and The Boy Behind the Door or Psycho Goreman, personal favorite of mine, to classics like Creepshow or Herzog's Nosferatu, or dig a little deeper to the really classic classics, like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari or Murnau's Nosferatu. It should be noted that those last two are silent films, so for those fellow eardrummers out there, if you need a jumping in point, well, there you have it. You like folk horror? I bet you do. I know I do. Then may I recommend the visual documentary Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched? It is the ultimate history of folk horror. It'll be like you're hearing folk horror for the first time. Only you'll be hearing it with your eyes. And ears. There's also sound in that one. Unless you turn the sound off and turn the subtitles on. Moving on. That's right, folks. You heard it here first. Shudder looks almost as good as I sound. I like Shudder. Nay, I love it. And if you're a fan of supernatural, thriller, and all things horror, you're going to love Shudder as much as I do. And right now, you can stream your first 30 days of Shudder for free. Go to Shudder.com and use code HORRORHILL. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com, code HORRORHILL, all one word, to stream your first 30 days of Shudder for free. Shudder.com, code HORRORHILL. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. We found the entrance where the map and Barnsley's elaboration said it would be. Even then, it wasn't easy. We trekked over the first steep hill behind the farm, then halfway down the other side. No trail, no signs. Just landmarks amid trees that all looked the same. It was screened so well a hiker could have passed by five feet away and not known it was there. Saplings had sprung up generations ago as the first rank of cover. Vines and ivy then hung like a curtain over a recessed doorway, a framework of huge black timbers anchored into the hillside. If it hadn't been the entrance to a very old mine, then it had been built by people who'd wanted to give that impression. If you got this far, a danger sign was there to warn you away bolted to a door stout enough for a medieval hall. It was secured with a padlock as big as a tuna can, whose shackle was thick enough to shrug off bolt cutters. Barnsley had given Ginny the key. I hurled the lock downslope as far as I could, in case he'd thought to come up later and secure it behind us. The door opened inward on quiet hinges. Something that can only have come from decades of oiling. I shined my flashlight on the back of the door, unsure whether I wanted to see evidence of someone having clawed at it to get out, unclear whether I was relieved that I did not. We were enveloped by an age-old smell of earth and stone, minerals and must. A claustrophobic corridor led in, braced by woodcut and cured when our grandparents were children. It ran level for yards, past the reach of daylight, and then plunged down into a darkness more absolute than I had ever known. It was more than an absence of light. It seemed a solid substance, letting our flashlights cut it because it knew it would heal instantly. Time to gear up. All we'd brought from home were pullover sweatshirts, while the back room at Barnsley's had provided everything else. 
knee-high rubber boots to slip over our shoes, and flashlights and hard hats with mounted lamps running to battery packs on our belts. Around my neck, I dangled a multi-gas detector. If we hit a hazardous level of methane or carbon monoxide or hydrogen sulfide, we had the face mask sheet cleaned and a small air tank on our backs. At the top of the steps, Jenny touched my arm. Is it even possible that Drew could still be? Her defenses were coming down. The shell had cracked, and she didn't have to pretend anymore. It was just me now. But I think I was still the one who needed to hold the other more. I want to believe so, I said, even if I don't see how. We began the descent down steps carved into rock and fashioned from wooden slabs until we hit a point where the way was smooth underfoot, the natural floor of a passage that undulated along like a serpent frozen in a slow, steady dive. Our hard hat lamps pushed ahead, squeezing the dark back. The air was cool and moist, like a cellar closed to the world, with the steady temperature of a late autumn day. The walls were grim and unfinished looking, nothing like the weathered stone on the surface, known to the sun and moon. Do you hear that? Jenny stopped and said at one point. Do you feel it? I had to follow her lead, but yes, I did. It was an ambience on the threshold of awareness, like the sound of time and the weight of the hills bearing down atop us. Our only sense of distance came from the map, charting our progress by a chamber, a turn, a branch peeling off to some place that hadn't been worth the cartographer's ink. In time, the floor became permanently damp, a layer of muck sucking at the soles of our rubber boots, and the air turned warmer. Hundreds of yards later, we were funneled to a cleft in the rock, an ancient fracture whose walls were just far enough apart to let us scoot through sideways. Along the way, we'd pass spots that left me wondering what was natural and what might have been worked. But by the end of this claustrophobic passage, there was no doubt it had been widened, with scars in the rock and matching chunks of rubble on the floor. As we emerged from the passage, an expanded sense of space swallowed our voices, and our headlamps turned feeble, without the closeness of the walls to contain them. We switched on our flashlights, too, and it became clear we'd emerged into Tecumseh No. 24's northernmost gallery, glints and glimmers reflecting from the unmined anthracite, as if the darkness had turned glossy. But to our left, despite our reason for being here, the only thing that mattered, we could only stop and stare. Here was the very definition of out of place and time. We swept our flashlight beams up and down it, and from side to side. Miners kept their ceilings from collapsing by leaving pillars of coal in key locations. But that did not explain this. It was too big, too square, and it wasn't coal. This was something else entirely, fashioned from harder stone, thirty feet on each side, and painstakingly chipped free of whatever coal had once entombed it. Its walls were flat on the smooth side of rough, except in three equidistant places where the entire structure was circled by bands of bas-relief carvings. Pictographs or hieroglyphs or ideograms that didn't connect with anything I knew or ever wanted to. Some of them might have been text. Some might have depicted life forms only from fossils, things that scuttled, swam, and flew 
chiseled with a stylized sense of aesthetics I couldn't begin to grasp. It looked to stand at least twenty feet tall, jutting through the low ceiling into the level above, but this was only the visible part. It didn't appear that our own level ground was its base. Where its sides met the floor, it looked as if someone had made an attempt to excavate further down, and the trenches they'd left behind were now filled with slurry carried by floodwaters of two years ago. Ginny traced her finger down one corner edge. It's not perfectly straight up and down. You see how it slopes in toward the top? She was right. It wasn't a pyramid, though. More like an enormous pylon. No seams, either, she said. This wasn't fitted together. It's all one piece. Barnsley called it a machine, though. An engine of creation, he called it. Do you believe him? I don't know yet. But consider the implications of how far down we were. Consider what this monolith was anchored in. Whatever its purpose, coal had formed around it, meaning it had stood in the swampy forests of a primeval world watching over the growth and death and decay of vegetation by the ton until it was buried. Millions of years. Tens of millions. Snippets of old science classes came floating back. The Carboniferous Period, I remembered that. And that the latter half was called the Pennsylvania Period. Just the sort of thing local science teachers enjoyed relating. An incomprehensible 300 million years ago. Yet, before any of that could have happened, this had been shaped with purpose and design and set in place for a reason. And the air, the air around it felt warm. It shouldn't have been warm. Trevor, Jenny whispered. That's what you did in the presence of such a thing. Whatever this is, it's not going anywhere. Let's get moving. We'll have time to wrap our heads around this later. Farther into the mine, freestanding water had pooled. The last remainder of the flood that had washed our lives from underneath us. A few inches deep at first, until we were wading in chilly black water that swirled near the top of our knee-high boots. Pale things slipped and slithered through it, away from us. Worm-like creatures that wriggled in the flashlight beam and then submerged as if to escape the glare. Okay, okay, maybe they'd washed down here from a cave system, a place where they'd always been. Even so, the more we saw of the mine and its galleries and corridors, the less any of it was what we'd expected. The water's surface was strewn with patches and swirls of lavender pond scum, algae that had learned to feed on something other than daylight. The rocky walls were slimed with growth. Gray fungus clung to the stone and coal, and climbed frameworks of century-old timbers that helped secure the ceiling. This wasn't a defunct mine anymore. It was becoming an ecosystem, hundreds of feet from the reach of the sun. In the main tunnel, I stepped on something that shifted beneath my boot, then gave with a crunch. I probed with my foot, too much rubber in the way to discern anything, so I pushed up my sleeves and plunged my hand into the cold water. When it came up, with a length of spinal column and a rib cage, I flung them away in disgust. Ginny stared after the splash. One of the miners... Almost forty of them died down here. Those poor men couldn't all have buried each other. And these Barnsleys don't seem like they were ever the type to do right by the dead. It was obvious that she hadn't seen the bones as well as I had. 
In that glimpse I caught in the headlamp, they didn't seem right. There was something malformed about them. The spine was overly long and twisted, as if from scoliosis. The ribcage had seemed wider, flatter. To me, it was only human because of expectations. Actually, I wasn't sure it was human at all. But I wasn't going to dredge it up again for another look. We kept going, calling out for Drew as our lamps bounced off the disturbed water to make the walls ripple with shadow and light. It brought this place alive in all the worst ways. The movement tricking us into thinking we weren't alone. That something was trying to flank us. We cleared one gallery, then another. Not hard, here, where the water came to our knees. However, Drew had gotten in from the slope shaft. He would have sought higher ground, dry earth. We were slogging our way to the next gallery when a new sound began to creep up on us. A growing hum, low and steady, like a ground loop in a loudspeaker. As it was originating from behind us... There seemed only one possible source. Whatever the so-called engine of creation was, I decided I'd rather know than not. I splashed back up the main tunnel, following my lights as they bounced around the curves until I could see this aberration again. The hum had been joined by a second sound. A hollow, resonant grinding like stone or metal dragged across itself. As Jenny splashed along behind me, we came in sight of the engine as it began to emit a pressurized hiss. A miasmal fog jetted from rows of narrow vents that had opened along the bands of carved symbols. It drifted along the roof line, then began to disperse and descend. It may have been no more than water vapor, but this was nowhere from misplaced trust. Masks, I said, and Jenny was already ahead of me. We opened the valves of our air canisters, then backed away from the cloud and resumed the slog ahead. At our backs, the warming air felt thickened, soupy. The multi-gas detector around my neck didn't make a peep, a relief. And the truth was, whatever the engine was generating... We'd probably been breathing some degree of residue this whole time, because this event couldn't have been a one-off. Undoubtedly, the structure had been doing this for a long, long time. Maybe it had reactivated during the flood. Maybe it had been running for decades, triggered by the miner's discovery event. Or maybe it never stopped, and it continued to operate in its tomb of coal venting fumes through minute cracks all the way to the surface and bubbling through the groundwater. It outgassed for three or four minutes before falling silent again. Only then did I think to activate the timer function on my watch. Depending on how much longer we were here, I could see if it was random or had a pattern. Further south, we found a shoreline along the stagnant black lake where the next gallery led up to dry ground. In its farthest recesses, our lights swept across a row of heaped debris. When we saw what looked like filthy rags, we glanced at each other, and through our masks I saw that Ginny's eyes looked as stricken as I felt. The air, I imagined, was vile here. What lay before us was mostly bones, many of them all long past stinking, but there were bodies, too. Putrid, with advanced decay. The bones were caked with mud and wrapped with rotten vegetation, the fibrous debris that gets swept along with floodwaters. Their arrangement was too orderly to be anything but deliberate. Someone had pulled these jumbled skeletons from the water, piece by piece after the chaos had calmed, the kind of thing a survivor would do. As for the bodies, I counted eight, but these were newer casualties. 
Decaying for two years sounded about right, as if they'd perished in the same deluge that had scattered the bones. As if men given up for dead long ago had, in defiance of every natural law, clung to life all this time. I just couldn't tell what their corpses were supposed to be. Not anymore. No, Ginny said. Only that and nothing else. No, no, no. If someone, Otto Barnsley maybe, had assured me they'd been men once, minors all, I would have said okay. I can see that. But then what? What happened to them? What happened to their skulls? To flatten the cranial domes? Why did their jaws seem to jut? Uppers and lowers alike? Why did their teeth look like ivory pegs now? And why had their limbs shortened? What made their rib cages look squashed in, flattened out, as if no longer meant for people who walked, but instead for things that crawled? Never in my life would I have thought that for men abandoned by the world, starving and dehydrating in the dark, would have been the merciful thing. I took Jenny's hand so we could finish what we'd started, and when we spotted him in the next gallery, even from a distance of many yards away, I knew it had to be Drew, because the heap along one rough wall was so much smaller. Just one person, lost in perpetual darkness, swathed in dirty clothes I never thought I would see again. How he had loved that blue flannel shirt. My boy. Oh, my beautiful boy. Jenny ran to him, the way only a mother would, stripping the mask from her face and letting it dangle by the tube to bang against her legs. Her helmet clattered across the ground, the beam of light cartwheeling as she dropped beside him. To touch him, hold him, as only... A mother could. I took my mask off too. Where you go, I go. But as a father, God forgive me, I was slower. Because I was terrified of what I would find. Then, appalled, my what was there. Drew was beyond pale, with pallor of skin no longer meant for a world with the sun. Our lights caused him pain, made him flinch and recoil, but even that movement looked clumsy. What happened inside when bones softened, when sinews relaxed? This. This happened. This puddled bag of reconstituting skin and bones that struggled to sit upright. I recognized the voices beside him. Weeping and trying to soothe him, but he had trouble saying anything in return. We're here, we told him. We're here. He croaked and sobbed and made sounds unlike anything I'd ever heard from a person. And where was the grin I remembered? That smile that could brighten rooms? Gone along with most of his teeth and half of his once shaggy hair. I dropped at his other side so that Ginny and I looked at each other across him the way we would when he was bedridden and tiny. Chicken pox, mumps, fevers and colds. He always got better. We'd always feared he wouldn't. No reason, it's just the way you worry when they're little. You never quite lose that fear. Even after they've grown so robust, they seem immortal. And for all I knew, that's what he was now. The corpses next door were proof of that. Barring calamity, he might live for ages. Just no longer in a form I would recognize as anything that had come from me. He wouldn't want this. He couldn't want this. We couldn't leave him to it. 
Not our Drew, and not Katie either, because a part of her would always be caught down here with him. In the timeless black. Jenny touched him so much more readily than I could. She stroked his cheeks until he could open his eyes. She put her face close to him so he would know how much she loved him. She found the kind of smile I would have thought she'd left above. She wiped away both their tears, making mud of the grime on their cheeks. She touched her lips to his clammy forehead and held his hand so gently, because it seemed as if one good squeeze might crush its bones. I'd never known such shame, because it was all I could do to rest my hand on his sinking chest, feeling its shallow, panting breaths, fighting the sort of disgust that strains the very fabric of a love you thought was inviolable. And she knew. Jenny knew. She knew everything that mattered right then. Why don't you go? She said after a while. Back out to the tunnel. You should go. When I protested, a whisper, I don't want you here for this. For a few more moments, I curled on the floor beside him, shaking, and so did she. I kept my eyes shut. It was purely presence then. The ineffable spirit of someone you love that you could never mistake for someone else. And it was true. My boy. My beautiful boy. But fading away into something else. Then I kissed him and left them together for as long as it would take Jenny to do what we both knew I could not. Time to wrap our heads around things later. That was the promise. Right now, it was all I had to keep my mind from cracking in two. I sat by the edge of the black lake, the surface as still as a sheet of obsidian. These were the shallows, but there had to be depths too. A gradual decline, or a sudden drop into a cold chasm. The diver who'd searched the bottom of the slope shaft found as much, even if he hadn't been able to navigate a way through it. Yet Drew had. The two sides were connected, and Drew had found the way. Tumbled from his car downhill all the way into the water at the bottom, and instead of crawling back up the shaft towards daylight, He'd emerged over here, hurt, disoriented, in darkness, and without an air tank, he'd accidentally done what a trained diver couldn't. I couldn't believe that at all. But I could believe he'd been brought by someone who already knew the way. As recently as the flood, survivors from the cave-in had been alive down here. Don't ask how, not yet. Just go with what I can say for certain. There were survivors. I'd seen the bodies. Bodies and bones that someone had cared for. So there had been at least one survivor from the flood as well. Good God. Imagine that. Entombed alive nine decades of abandonment, betrayal, mutation... I couldn't imagine anything lonelier than being the sole survivor after your pitch-black world was inundated and the last of your fellow exiles have drowned. If even one spark of humanity remained, you'd do anything to not be alone anymore. What a gift, Drew must have seemed. Back in the gallery, Ginny was singing to him, a cradle lullaby I hadn't heard in 18 years. The acoustics made it sound as if we were in a church instead of a tomb. At my feet, on the shore of this stagnant lake, the black glass surface rippled as if disturbed from far away. 
I moved nothing more than my eyes, scanning the shadows as far as they let me see. It may have only been the flipping of one of those pale eels I'd seen earlier, but I didn't think so. So, with one ear, I followed Ginny's song, and with the other, listened for a splash. I let the grief in deeper and imagined how she would do it. She knew how to break people, but knew how to put them to sleep, too. She knew how to wrap her arm around someone's neck from behind, how to notch their throat in the crook of their elbow, and squeeze so the blood stopped flowing to the brain. It's only uncomfortable for a few seconds. Then, your foe's lights go out. That's when you should release the choke, unless you intend lasting harm. To kill the brain, all you have to do is keep holding the person close and not let go for the longest few minutes of your life. Up the tunnel, back where we come in, the engine of creation hummed to life again. I checked my watch. 36 minutes. Then reset the timer and debated putting my mask back on. Could be it was too late already, because we'd breathe the air down here before we'd ever switch to the tanks. I hoped it took more exposure than that. Days of it. Weeks, maybe. It was the key to everything, though. If something could rightly be called an engine of creation, then it could just as easily be an engine of recreation. Terraforming. That was the word that came to mind paving the way for life as something altogether other knew it. I pictured the monolith as it must have been, a mysterious and indestructible pylon squatting in the forested hush of our world at its most primeval. Humming like a swarm of dragonflies the size of condors and spewing its fumes to the wind, casting seeds of life and metamorphosis. One of dozens... Assuming this was what was marked on that map on Barnsley's wall, pinned with sights from pole to pole. Its vast antiquity was beyond questioning. Only who had put it here was up for grabs. Barnsley's many gods, I had to guess. The worthy gods. The gods that cared only about worlds and not their inhabitants. Least of all, a few poor scabs who thought they'd found their fortune. Near my boots, the water line rippled again, as somewhere out in the darkness, drips and drops plinked to the surface. Down the tunnel, I glimpsed a pale shape, like the inverse of a shadow, rising from the water, then descending again. I wished I'd worn my old sidearm, but there were rocks. You poor bastards, I thought. Mythology was full of heroes who lamented that they were only the playthings of fickle gods. The miners would know better. They weren't even that much, just casualties to a process that had never factored them in in the first place. Behind me, the lullabies were no more. My family. Oh. My beautiful family. Still... I wondered if those miners hadn't battled like heroes just the same. For months, one thing had bugged me about that slope shaft. The only apparent opening was the one Drew had been diverted into. The rescuers hadn't found any sign of a corresponding opening on the other side of the vertical. But nobody could afford to worry about that at the time. So what if it had never been... A long-forgotten shaft sunk from the surface at all. Suppose it had been dug from below by something trying to get out. Whatever the miners were becoming, and scabs or not, some may yet have known how to excavate a tunnel that wouldn't collapse on them. They'd only misjudged and run into the blockage that Tecumseh had dumped down the main shaft. Maybe by then, they'd realize they didn't have time to try again. Christ, how had they lived even that long? Water could have been seeping in even then, and for a time, they might have fed on their dead. Beyond that, I didn't want to know. 
The engine of creation had made them its own soon enough. One thing was certain. By the time Alvin Barnsley had found his way back in, his comrades were no longer fit for the topside world. Otherwise, they would have left. I knew it was done when Ginny sobbed. The sound ripped from an imploding core, and something in me broke too. We had no son anymore. Katie had no brother. We had only memories now, until our minds might unravel and let them spill with all the rest. For a moment, I intended to rejoin her, then reconsidered. No. She would want these moments to herself as well. This I knew. Sometimes, it felt like I knew her so well I had no idea who she actually was anymore. As for whatever had been watching from the deepest darkness of the mine, and must have fled when it heard us coming, it understood what had just happened as well as any of us. It must have been waiting for this moment to approach. At first, it was merely ripples coming toward me, a V-shape gliding through the water, the vague suggestion of something's back. Then, it hit the shallows and struggled to find its feet again. I caressed the rock in my hand. And, if one good thing could come of such a terrible moment, it was that I could feel peace over what we'd spared our son. In it, you could still see the man it had been, even if it was a man reshaped by the archaic reptilian forms lost to a world 300 million years gone. The connection wasn't in its eyes, though. It had none, only vestigial bumps where they'd been. It found me by sound alone. It wasn't in the shape of the face, either, with the flattened crown of its skull and the wide, jutting jaw brimming with pegged teeth. It wasn't in the grotesquely lengthened torso, or the stumpy limbs, or the skin so pale it looked blue against the black. And it certainly wasn't in the thick, tapering tail it was trying to hide. No. It was in the pride it took in trying to stand. There was the man, in his pride and the way he carried the ancient miner's pick in the clawed appendage that had been his hand. I let my rock drop to the floor. Even across three hundred million years of speciation in a creature I had never seen, I knew his body language. I knew exactly what he was begging for. He offered me the pick, then plopped to the ground on all fours, half out of the water and half in, where he looked so much more at home. And with his head at my feet, he waited. I should have hated him for what he'd done to us. I should have condemned him to a life of renewed solitude. But I couldn't. He'd only wanted what we all want. Wretched as he was, he had only wanted. To not feel so alone. In my hand, the pick's handle felt rough and rotten, sloughing off splinters. The iron end curved into spikes like a rusty crescent moon. I squeezed it until my knuckles went as pale as he was, then hoisted the tool over my head. I could think of nothing crueler in the cosmos than gods that cared only about worlds. It took an inhabitant to care about mercy. You've been listening to Part 2 and the Conclusion to On These Blackened Shores of Time 
by Brian Hodge. For part one of this story, please go to last week's episode, Horror Hill Season 5, Episode 15. On These Blackened Shores was written by and brought to you courtesy of Brian Hodge. Brian, called a writer of spectacularly unflinching gifts by no less than Peter Straub, is the award-winning author of ten novels of horror and crime noir. He's also written over 100 short stories, novelettes, and novellas, and four full-length collections. His most recent collection, 2011's Picking the Bones, became the first of his books to be honored with a publisher's weekly starred review. His first collection, The Convulsion Factory, was ranked by critic Stanley Wyatter among the 113 best books of modern horror. He lives in Colorado, where more of everything is in the works. He also dabbles in music, sound design, and photography. Loves everything about organic gardening, except the thieving squirrels, and as a fellow Colorado resident, the squirrels here truly are assholes. He also trains in Krav Maga and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which are of no use at all against the squirrels, because they're quite swift. Connect through his website, brianhodge.net, or on Facebook under his handle, Brian Hodge Writer, all one word. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness, I bet you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill, unless otherwise noted. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors, sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Felipe Ojeda under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's logo was created by Craig Groshek, and this week's artwork provided by Omega Black, unless otherwise noted. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. 
You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hell on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for hundreds of free audio horror stories, including more performances from yours truly, and consider supporting us by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, I'm Jason Hill, and you've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast. Good evening, and sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.